Well, first I would like to thank everybody for attending this presentation, the university itself, the AHA Foundation, and the Minnesota Center for Chemical and Mental Health, which is I think the facility we're in right now, or is this the university? This is the School of Social Health. Okay, thank you. And to the audience, of course, because this is a very difficult and complicated issue, and it's a very sensitive subject, and it's difficult to talk about or listen to. But since I have quite a bit of material to cover, I'm going to ask if you could kindly hold your questions to the end of the presentation. I'm referring now to the people in the audience here. Thank you. My talk will be an overview of FGM, including the consequences of this practice, current trends, and immigration. There will be no photos or videos of girls being cut, but there will be some medical slides included. So female genital mutilation. Uh-oh, this is not working. Sorry, folks. It's not advancing. Let's see. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was trying usually do it that way. It works. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, folks. Female genital mutilation is a culturally sanctioned trauma, an ancient harmful tradition that has been practiced for over 2,000 years. Thankfully, increasing global awareness of this practice has grown over the past few decades due to the women's movement, 24-7 news coverage, and social media. The World Health Organization defines female genital mutilation as the description you have above here all procedures involving partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. Now there are various terms used to describe this practice. Most indigenous women refer to their cutting as circumcision, but this term can be misleading as it can be thought to equate female circumcision to male circumcision, and then it obscures the serious side effects that some women can suffer. If we were to anatomically compare the two surgeries, most of the male penis would be removed. Female genital mutilation is a term used by a wide range of women's health and human rights organizations, including the UN, to emphasize that the practice is considered a mutilation of the female genitalia and a violation of women's basic human rights. Some organizations have opted to use the more neutral term female genital cutting since practicing communities find the use of the term mutilation demeaning, implying intentional malice on the part of the parents or circumcisers. And this risks us alienating the communities we seek to serve. I interchange these terms depending on the audience, but today I will be using the term FGM to refer to this practice. When working with a survivor, I always use the terminology she uses. You will most often see the combination of these terms used in this acronym, FGM slash C. But before we continue, it's important to review, briefly review female genital anatomy. This is a diagram of the vulva and most structures of the vulva are affected by this practice. The clitoral hood, the glands, the very tip of the clitoris, which is the pearl-sized tip of the clitoris. This pearl-sized tip contains approximately 8,000 nerve fibers, more than anywhere else found in the human body and more than twice the amount found on the head of a penis. So that's clearly affected the outer lips, the inner lips, the vaginal entrance, the perineum. All of these structures can be affected or can be harmed in the practice of FGM. But actually the clitoris is three quarters larger below the surface of the skin inside the body. So here you have a diagram that shows the external and internal perspective. And the clitoral body underneath the surface is a wishbone shaped structure that is about three and a half inches in length and about two and a half inches in width. It extends interiorly and then splits downward into two leg-like parts called the crura and the vestibular bulbs all of which are composed of erectile tissue and swell during sexual arousal. 
Actually, if you lift the skin off the sides of the vagina, you will find the bulbs of the clitoris. So one can consider that during vaginal in intercourse, it is a clitoral complex that is stimulated. Because of this extended internal structure, sexual stimulation and sensation need not be limited to the glands clitoris. So, so many women are so upset if their clitorises are removed, understandably so, but then they think nothing works. And that's not exactly true. There are many women who are cut and have perfectly fine sexual activity, and there are others that don't. So it varies. Now, here you have um, a diagram of the internal clitoris superimposed on the photograph of a vulva. So you could imagine what it looks like if you're looking through the skin. And then using M MRI technology, this next slide is a 3D representation of an erect clitoris shown here in yellow, looks like a Georgia O'Keeffe painting, of a woman in a standing position. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Now, what's important to realize too is that what can also affect sensitivity and arousal is the complex set of genital nerve pathways that women have. The pelvic nerve branches in individual ways for every woman, which explains the variation in women's preference for stimulation. Some women's nerves branch more into the vagina, others into the clitoris, others into the perineum. No two women, not even identical twins, have the same pattern and distribution of nerves. The pathway distribution is quite different and far more diffuse from male sexual wiring, which is much more uniform in design. So again, we have to celebrate the diversity. Now the World Health Organization classifies four major types of FGM cuttings, but there are multiple subdivisions even within these categories. Type one, which is what you see here on the left, is commonly referred to as clitorectomy or SUNA. It involves partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the clitoral hood. Historically, <laughs> clitorectomies were also performed in Britain, Australia, and the United States. In the US, this surgery was implemented during the 1880s, referred to as biomedical clitorectomy or declitorizing. It was used to treat hysteria excess sexual drive, masturbation, insanity, and lesbianism. Even into the 1970s, 3,000 such operations were performed here in America, and their costs were covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, type two, commonly referred to as excision, is the partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora with or without excision of the labia majora. Type three is referred to as infibulation or pharaonic circumcision. It involves the narrowing of the vaginal opening by the removal of the labia and the clitoris. The raw edges of the vulva are then sewn together, creating a small opening, sometimes the size of a straw for the passage of urine and menses. For these women in particular, sexual intercourse can occur only after gradual dilation of this small opening through painful repeated attempts, and it can take quite some time before a couple can consummate their marriage. Another practice is for a woman to go to a medical practitioner to be cut open called defibrillation, in which then there is not that initial pain that occurs when a woman is closed and is tried to be opened by her husband. Some men have experienced situational impotence when attempting to penetrate their wives because it is so painful that they stop trying. And just, I've had husbands come to me, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to be with my wife, I feel so bad because she's in so much pain. So, sorry, sorry Joe. Okay. Now, refibrillation, so the woman is opened either manually over time or through defibrillation, and then 
if she becomes widowed or divorced, or even after the birth of her child, she can be re again. So there are multiple traumas that are, that are given to the genital area, depending on the tribe, the tradition, and the particular culture that you've been, that you have to participate in. Now type four is anything else that's injurious to the female genitalia. Cauterizing the clitoris, scraping or introducing corrosive substances into the vagina to tighten the opening. These are some of the practices. Now this is, I've just said all of this, so it's going to be in the slide. I don't need to repeat it. It identifies each of the types I've just gone through. And then this next slide, just so you're aware, uh, describes the variations of each type of cut for medical identification and coding purposes. So when I'm helping a woman get asylum and she needs a medical examination for her asylum case, the gynecologist will actually itemize what kind of cutting she's had. Not just that she's gone through FGM, but it's coded specifically for different reasons, for medical reasons and for legal reasons. Uh, this next video clip will, will review some of the cuts I've just shown you and show medical examples on a computer screen. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Sarah Crichton runs three FGM clinics a month at London's Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital, seeing between two to three hundred women a year. FGM stands for female genital mutilation, and it's a traditional practice which involves removal of part or all of the female external genitalia. There are three main types of FGM, as classified by the World Health Organization. The first type is type 1, sometimes called Sunna FGM, and that involves removal of the prepuce, which is the piece of skin over the clitoris, analogous to the male foreskin. Type 2 is sometimes called an intermediate FGM, and that involves removal of the prepuce, but also some or all of the clitoris. And sometimes part of the labia minora are removed as well. This first picture here is of a type 2 FGM, and if you can see, um, there's an area of scarring here. Um, this is the clitoris. She does have a little bit of clitoris left here. The labia minora are no longer present. The vaginal opening itself is in fact relatively normal, and you can see the urethra just, just beyond the vagina just here. Type 3 FGM, which is a sort seen most commonly by midwives and obstetricians, involves removal of all of the external genitalia. So that would be the clitoris, the labia minora and majora. And also involves closing the vagina to leave just a tiny opening for the passage of urine and menstruation. And you can see here the whole of the genital area is almost completely flat. There are no labia minora or majora there, and there's no evidence of any clitoral tissue present. This very tiny hole here at the back is the introitus, that's the opening for the, both the urethra and the vagina. And as you can see by its size, it's very scarred as well. It would be impossible to do a vaginal examination or to put a catheter through into the bladder in this lady. Who performs these surgeries? Traditional birth attendants, local, often elderly women of the village, or a member of the family. Very occasionally, there's a male doctor. For many, the operation constitutes a lucrative source of income. Instruments used to perform the operation include household knives, sharp stones, broken glass, and razor blades, which are rarely sterilized and often used to carry out multiple operations. <coughs> Anesthesia, except in some urban areas, is seldom used, and incisions are usually made with a girl lying on the floor, being held down by several women. Often iodine or a mixture of herbs, ash, Vaseline, mud, and dung are placed on the wound to tighten the vagina and stop the bleeding. Let's see this. The age at which the practice is carried out varies depending on the family or the community or the tribe, but it's usually between the ages of four and 10. This graph indicates ranges of, uh, range of ages that the girls are cut in various FGM practicing countries. So the blue is an indication of zero, in other words, from birth to four years old. 
Yellow is from five to nine. Orange is from 10 to 14 and dark blue is 15 or older. So for example, whereas in Egypt, most girls are cut between five to nine or 10 to 14. In Nigeria, girls are cut at the age of four or younger, traditionally. So who, where does this happen? Um, predating Christianity and Islam, the practice of FGM has been followed by many different people and societies throughout the ages and across continents. Cutting across all socioeconomic levels and occurring amongst the educated classes as well as the uneducated in rural areas as well as the urban cities. This global map shows the affected regions. In fact, I just recently read that FGM has been um, documented on every continent except Antarctica. I just read that. Um, so here we have the blue, the, green, the blue green is an indication of the African states that practice it. And it's, it's primarily an African tribal tradition, but it exists in many other places as well. The orange says that it's documented without the prevalence being measured. So we have these countries here. And then the yellow is reported within some ethnic groups, but it's not documented. And then everywhere else, this is all the diaspora where we know it, it, it exists. If, if not carried out, at least we have affected women in these areas. As I said, although primarily practiced in Africa, FGM has also been reported in Indonesia, Malaysia, parts of the Persian Gulf, among ethnic minorities in Yemen, Oman, the UAE, Iran, and Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, in this map, orange indicates that it's known to be prevalent. We know that in Indonesia, 49% of the women are cut. Uh, the, the yellow is indicates that it affects more than one community. And in green, it says that there are some indications that FGM exists. So for example, Saudi Arabia never had FGM until recently. And now because of migration patterns there, this is being reported more often. According to UNICEF, it is estimated that there are approximately 200 million women survivors in the world today. More than half of these survivors live in just three countries, Indonesia, Egypt and Ethiopia. 44 million are girls under the age of 15. Now this is a graph showing what religions practice this. But although there are no religious texts prescribing this practice, some practitioners often believe that the tradition has religious support and it is practiced by Coptic Christians in Egypt followers of the animist faith, such as the Maasai in Kenya, as well as by some Ethiopian Jews. While most Muslims do not recognize FGM as a religious requirement, most conservative Islamic societies, they don't practice it, but they have leaders that advocate for it and proclaim that it promotes Islamic ideals of family honor, female chastity, and seclusion. So in this slide, purple is an indication of Muslims practicing this. Roman Catholics are in pink and other cult, the darker pink are other Christian faiths, such as Protestants, Catholics, Coptic Christians. Um, so you see, it's very mixed. It's not, everyone always thinks it's just the Muslims that do this. It's not necessarily true. Although the most of the girls that are cut happen to be Muslim most of the Muslim world does not practice this. So it's a little contradictory. This next slide says, where does it actually happen in Africa? And the countries that are highlighted in red have very high incident rates. So we have Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, Djibouti, Mali, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. 80% or more prevalence rates. This next map of Africa shows where infibulation occurs, that 
most severe type of cutting. And it's uh, in fibrillation occurs in all the states, that, uh, countries I just mentioned, plus Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. Now, what's important to remember is that this is a tradition that straddles boundaries of countries. So it's more accurate to view FGM as being practiced by specific ethnic groups rather than by a whole country. Somalia, most all of the country practices it. But if you go to Ethiopia or Kenya, you'll see that there's a lot of diversification. Some pockets have very high concentration of high rates and others not so much at all. And this is a map uh, from 216 indicating the estimated percentage rates per country. It is not entirely clear where or when the practice of FGM originated. There are many theories. One suggests that circumcision may have replaced human sacrifice as a way of placating hostile spirits, or even as a sacrifice to the deities presiding over fertility. But by the time of the fifth century BC, there is evidence that female clitorectomies existed, and Herodotus mentions the custom specifically and tells us that it was practiced by the Phoenicians, the Hittites, Ethiopians, and Egyptians. No matter how it may have begun, there are persistent myths and beliefs that perpetuate the tradition to this day. In fact, as I've mentioned, many still believe FGM is a religious requirement and that undergoing the practice is considered a sign of religious devotion. The ability of uncut women to remain faithful through their own choice is doubted. And in many of these societies, it is difficult, if not impossible for a woman to marry if she has not been cut. FGM is seen as a social prerequisite of marriage, believed to preserve a woman's virginity, chastity, and fidelity by restraining her sexual impulses, which are considered shameful. The protection of women from willing or unwilling illegitimate sex is vital because the family's honor depends upon their daughter's virtue. Access to land and security is through marriage and only excised women are considered suitable for marriage. Additionally, a bride's virginity can almost guarantee acquiring a husband from a wealthier economic status. So this is some of the mythology that perpetuates the tradition. The female body becomes the medium of culture, the medium of exchange. Women are socialized from childhood to think of their bodies in terms of the other, in terms of mother, husband, mother-in-law. Through this ritualized surgery, the female body, body is carved into the social realm as females are constructed into women from male parts by other women. It is believed that removal of the clitoris eliminates what are thought to be masculine parts, preventing the female from developing male traits such as aggression or promiscuity. In these communities, the clitoris is pathologized and thought to be so dangerous that if it touches a man's penis, he will die, or that if it touches the baby's head during childbirth, the baby will be spiritually harmed or die. I've worked with several women who were cut twice because they're the deaths of their babies were blamed on faulty circumcision in that enough of the contaminated genital tissue was not removed. Also, it is believed that unless a woman's clitoris is excised, it can go down and hang between her legs like a penis, fueling her sexual appetites. Also, because it is considered a small penis, the clitoris is viewed as a physical barrier to coitus obstructing a woman's chances of becoming pregnant. What's really interesting is that a colleague just sent me um, a review of an article that was just published in Clit Clit uh, Clinical Anatomy. And it says that stimulating the clitoris activates the brain to cause a combination of changes in the female reproductive tract. 
that creates its readiness to receive and process sperm in order to achieve possible fertilization of the egg. So if this can get out into the community and they can understand, hey, no, the clitoris is really important for reproductive purposes, it might just help change the mythology involved in this. I've just highlighted here um, the reasons that FGM persists, so it's, it'll be in your handout. There are multiple and chronic complications from this practice. Initially, there can be severe bleeding, shock secondary to blood loss or pain, trauma to the adjacent structures, local infection, especially when unsterile cutting instruments are used or if they are used on several girls at once. Failure to heal, septicemia, tetanus, urinary retention. Hemorrhaging can occur and lead to death. But up until recently, these deaths were not attributed to FGM. Rather, they were explained away as God's will or punishment for some immoral behavior. Long-term complications can include cysts, fluid-filled lesions that form on the vulva region, epidermal inclusions, menstrual difficulties, painful intercourse, recurrent urinary tract infections, prolonged labor, and fistulas. Chronic pelvic infections can spread to the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries, leading to pelvic inflammatory disease, which can result in infertility. Parents are often unaware of the harmful medical consequences of these surgeries because the complications of FGM are usually normalized or attributed to other causes and rarely discussed outside the family. Tragically, the same procedure that makes their daughter marriageable may ultimately contribute to her infertility. The failure to produce children is blamed on women, which can lead to rejection by her husband or extended family. Although most of the focus to date has been on the physical and medical complications of FGM, there is increasing attention concerning the psychological consequences. As most of us here know, a traumatic event is defined as direct or indirect exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. The incident may be something that threatens the person's life or the life of someone close to the victim. Symptoms that persist following a traumatic incident may be especially long or severe if the stressor has been of human design. Those that can remember say they will never forget the day they were cut. Not surprisingly, it has been reported that the psychological trauma that women experience through FGM often stays with them for the rest of their lives. As one can imagine, the initial emotional and physical reactions of this surgery can range from intense fear, helplessness, horror, extreme pain, humiliation, and betrayal. Many suffer from a multi-phase trauma, anticipating the experience, being coerced and forced down. Seeing or hearing another family member endure the procedure is a form of secondary trauma. Some of the women I've worked with were not comforted during or after this surgery and even ridiculed for crying. They were told to be brave and courageous and thus better equipped to endure life's many hardships, not least of which would be childbirth. One woman I work with was screaming and trying to kick and hit her cutter and her mother stepped in and hit her. So another woman I worked with was very comforted before and after by her mother who was watching the whole experience. Um, another young woman I worked with um, in tandem with FGM received scarification on her back. That's keloid scarring shaped into a particular pattern or design. And she didn't remember the FGM, but she remembered the scarification. 
The younger you are, the less you may remember because conscious explicit memory doesn't begin until we're 18 months of age. But implicit memory, memory that registers from trauma and visceral sensations or flashes of memory, of sight, of smell, that's registered in the body from birth. What the mind forgets, the body remembers in the form of fear, pain, or physical illness. Women who have undergone FGM may be affected by chronic pain, which can increase their risk of depression, reduce social functioning, and contribute to a sense of worthlessness. Some women may develop persistent negative emotional states such as fear, anger, guilt, or shame, or engage in distorted thinking and suffer from low self-esteem and concerns about body image. Some may become aggressive and self-destructive, Others feeling detached and numb have trouble showing or accepting affection and may lose interest in people or activities they used to enjoy. Survivors that feel betrayed may develop problematic relationships with their mothers or female authority figures in their family or community, those women who promoted and supported their surgeries. There are generally four survivor perspectives those that remember and suffer psychological, physical, medical consequences, those that don't remember, but it may become a problem once they are older and have a different perspective. Those that understood it was necessary to survive within the culture. One woman I work with, um, <clears throat> her mother did not want her to get cut. She was vehement about it. But the, the young, when she was a teenager, she went and got cut with all the rest of her friends, not having any idea the extent of the surgery she was going to receive, nor how painful it was going to be. And she went home the next day in an infibulated state. And of course, there are those who really believe in the practice, who feel proud and strong and courageous for having undergone this uh, surgery. Survivors who choose to speak out against this cultural tradition often face multiple levels of stigmatization. First, because they're from a non-dominant culture. Second, because they have experienced a cultural practice that has been identified in Western discourse as harmful. And then by their own cultural group as a possible betrayer of their <coughs> culture. Many, in fact, fear reprisals from their community. Since I've known this woman the past 15 years, Layla Hussein has become a global activist in the campaign to fight FGM. She lives in London. This short video clip that I will show next is taken from the BAFTA nominated documentary called The Cruel Cut. Once this film was released, Layla could not leave her home for five days due to the death threat she received from her Somali community in London. So. Uh oh. Uh, I don't have. I was cut when I was seven years old. I remember waking up really early in the morning and I remember the sun beaming through our bedroom window. I heard really painful screaming. I knew it was my sister because she kept calling out for my mother. She was like, oh, you know, where's my mummy? Where's my mummy? I heard them say, get Layla, get Layla now, it's Layla's turn. All of a sudden, my dress was pulled up, my legs were pulled apart, my knees were literally on my shoulders. Four women held me down. I was trying to kick, punch, he grabbed my uh, clitoris, pulled it, and I felt him cutting through, cutting through. I felt every single cut, pull, Stitching, I felt it, I felt the whole thing. I was screaming so much, I just blacked out. I'm Leila Hussein. Like another 66,000 British women, I've endured female genital mutilation, OFGM, which is cutting off the genitals. Mine was done in Somali before I moved here. But each year, British girls are taken away to be cut. It's also done right here in the UK. 
As far as I'm concerned, no way near enough is being done to protect the 24,000 girls estimated to be at risk in the UK from this child abuse. This is my campaign to stop female genital mutilation here in the UK once and for all. Hold your sensitivity is preventing any real discussion around FGM, and it's about time this was shaken up. We wouldn't be talking about this if it was white vaginas, but it's been black and Asian vaginas who's interested, of course. First of all, I'm going to teach the great British public what FGM really is, and that this horror is happening to British girls. Can you see the razor there? That's the kind of instrument that I've been used. How can anyone think that's okay? <laughs> Next, I'll challenge the practicing communities in the UK to stand up for their girls and abandon this barbaric cultural practice that has no place in this world. I'm going to show you exactly what happened. Oh, oh God. Why are we doing this? Why are elders doing this? The reason women are being cut is for you. Do you understand? Finally, I'll take my campaign to the very top of British government. Petitioning them to take control and demanding we stop FGM in the UK for good. They've shut the door, guys. Yeah. yeah. I'm 22 years old. I'm living in Manchester and I was cut when I was six years old. I had my FGM done when I was about four. I had FGM when I was seven years old. I was only 11 years old when I was initiated. It's like a party where you know you're going to be cut and it's something we've been getting ready from very young age. I thought it was like baptism. I thought they were going to wash me with all this traditional medicine. The lady came, the cutter, she told me what to do, I need to lay down in front of her. They put a big table on the patio and there was lots of people watching. She took out the razor blade and I started to panic straight away, I started to scream. There was already blood on the floor and little bits of skin. The next thing I was lying on the floor, and there's this huge woman, very big. She sat on my, my chest and it spread my legs apart. I remember the first cut of the blade, you know, going through your skin, so sharp. I had the most pain. I can't explain it. It felt like I was burning. I didn't stop crying and I did not stop bleeding. It's indescribable. It's, it's a kind of pain that never leaves you. It doesn't matter if you're having a good day or a bad day. You'll always have that image popping to your head of you standing over your own pool of blood looking at your flesh. Um, where I left off was we were listening to Layla Hussein talk about, and, and the women that she's worked with and knows talking about the experience of having been cut. And what I started to say is that I find that many survivors are troubled and call themselves because of repeated flashbacks and states of dissociation that they feel that they can't control. And by helping them understand how the nervous system responds automatically, helps to develop self-compassion, which is a very necessary ingredient for healing trauma. So a traumatic event overwhelms us, dis disrupting our normal functioning, impacting both the body and the brain, which interact with one another to regulate our biological states of arousing. Although the neurobiology of trauma involves very complex neurochemical and neuroanatomical functions, I would just briefly like to review what happens neurobiologically. And this is something I explain in groups too when I work with survivors. So well, how do I how do I go forward? Just the click here. Huh. Yep. You can just use the arrows. That's what I was doing. Which okay. one? I was using this one, right? I just yep. used is this the right one? Okay, so we don't have, oh good, that's good up there, but as I was trying to explain before, the brain that we have currently has evolved over its capabilities over the past 500 million years. And although this isn't written here on the right, I'll go through it. It's coming up choppy. The first brain to develop was the reptilian brain, and this includes the brainstem, which is concerned with physical survival and maintenance of the body. 
This ancient brain cannot differentiate its reactions from, uh, from, my, from current to past. Its reactions are unconscious, automatic, and highly resistant to change. The limbic system, also referred to as the mammalian brain, is the second brain that evolved, and it's the center for emotional responsiveness, memory formation, integration, and includes mechanisms to keep ourselves safe, namely the defenses of fight, flight, or freeze. Like the reptilian brain, it operates primarily on the subconscious level and without a sense of time. Can you remember waking up from a nightmare, sweaty and fearful? This is an example of the body reacting to an imagined threat as if it were real. The cerebral cortex is the most evolved part of the brain, and it enables complex thinking, reasoning, planning, speech, and writing. And the neocortex is that part of the cerebral cortex that is the most modern, and the prefrontal cortex is the front of the neocortex. Almost all of the brain's activity is conducted at the unconscious level. And while we like to think that we are making logical decisions, in fact, our ne neocortex is the tip of the iceberg and only responsible for 5 to 15% of our choices. This next slide identifies the structures in the limbic system. The pituitary is the master gland that communicates with all the other glands in the body. The thalamus is essentially a relay station, processing and transmitting movement and sensory information. The hypothalamus controls involuntary functions like hunger, body temperature, and hormonal activity. The hippocampus processes information, organizing and consolidating it into a pattern, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the amygdala, which is the most important part for our talk today, in the limbic system is the structure that encodes negative emotions like fear, anger, or sadness. It is so powerful that it is programmed to react automatically when confronted with situations perceived as dangerous without any feedback from the neocortex, which is the thinking part of the brain that could confirm to us objectively if we should be worried or not about an event that is occurring. But to survive a sudden threat, we need speed that is uncovered by the slow logical process of the cortex. If a car is coming, you need to jump out of its way. You don't think, I have to take five steps sideways. You just do it. It's automatic. It's instinctual. That's how we live and breathe and work most of the time. Oh, that's not the slide I want next. Okay. The acute stress response is mediated by a system called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And very briefly, what it does is that the thalamus registers the threat, real or imagined. The amygdala responds to the signal and alerts the hypothalamus, which acts as the command center, triggering the sympathetic nervous system to release stress hormones. So. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system are two branches of the automatic, autom autonomic, automatic nervous system. They just respond automatically. The sympathetic nervous system functions like a gas pedal in the car and triggers the fight or flight response, providing the body with a burst of energy, while the parasympathetic nervous system acts like a brake and promotes rest and digest, or as it's also known, breed and feed. So the parasympathetic nervous system is what's, what's involved with, uh, with feelings of comfort, relaxation, good sensations. These two systems work in, conjun in conjunction to manage the body's responses depending on the situation and need. So we have a traumatic event that's happening and there are over 30 stress hormones that are released into the limbic system including epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these stress hormones prepare the body to fight or flee. Our bodies tense, our hearts beat faster, our digestion slows down, our pupils dilate. The parasympathetic nervous system also releases natural opiates to blunt emotional and physical pain. 
Now these stress hormones flood the limbic system and disrupt the natural memory making function of the hippocampus. So that a woman is raped. She's undergoing FGM. She cannot go home. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that happened. Because the hippocampus that organizes everything we can filter into a cohesive narrative is awful. So when a person is blocked from fighting or fleeing successfully, then the body and brain are unable to successfully complete their reaction in response to the threat. And for many of those, the trauma doesn't end. It seemingly gets blocked in the nervous system. So, so the nervous system, the reaction that's not been able to be successfully completed, the girl could not fight back. The girl could not escape. So that kind of nervous energy stays locked in the, in the nervous system, in our body memory. So the limbic system stores our emotional memories, but trauma impairs the integrative functioning of the brain. The hippocampus tries to record inf information into a coherent story, but it's compromised by the deluge of stress hormones, and only fragments and flashes of the event are recorded. That's often why, too, sometimes uh, rape survivors are not believed, because they cannot remember coherently what happened to them. They remember a color. He had blue pants on and his breath smelled of alcohol, but they cannot remember a coherent, concise, linear passage of time and experience. So when an FGM woman is affected by or is re-triggered by a place, a person, a scent, initial or ongoing sexual activity, Gynecological examinations are great triggers for flashbacks. Childbirth itself. There can be a physical reliving of the trauma in those triggering moments. The amygdala becomes overactive with stress hormones, resulting in this persistent negative state of arousal. There is intrusive imagery and disorganized cognitive processing. And so you have classic symptoms of PTSD. Seemingly cementing these systems is the fact that neurons that fire together wire together. Every experience, thought, feeling, and physical sensation triggers thousands of neurons, which form a neural network in our brain. When you repeat an experience over and over, the brain learns to trigger the same neurons each time. With PTSD, neural networks get stuck in paths related to processing and encoding fear and anxiety, reflecting a condition in which the body's natural mechanisms for recovery have failed, in effect, making it hard to process information, eat, sleep, salivate, or be sexually aroused. Generally speaking, but not always, a survivor may have fewer psychosexual difficulties the younger she is when cut and the less severe the type of cut she received. But for those women experiencing sexual difficulties, the primary problem is painful intercourse, which can be caused by the removal of the clitoris, the labia leading to damaged nerve endings, clitoral neuromas, epidermal cysts, or chronic urinary tract infections. The development of inelastic scar tissue and adhesion surrounding the excised areas causes the narrowing of the vaginal canal, and this can also be very painful. So even if minimally cut, scar tissue can develop and affect the ability to experience pleasure. Because of repeated pain, women may develop anxiety responses to sex, and this can lead to avoidance, reduced arousal, vaginal dryness, muscular spasms, any or all of which can exacerbate painful intercourse and cause difficulties experiencing pleasure. Some women have reported that merely the fear of potential pain during intercourse can trigger these responses. During the stress reactions of a PTSD episode, there is restricted flow, flow to the genital area, 
whereas during sexual arousal, there is an increase in blood flow, causing the vascular congestion necessary for pleasurable experiences. So that's when those vestibular, excuse me, vestibular bulbs swell because of the increase of blood into those genital areas. So as we know now, neurons that fire together, wire together, and chronic pain triggers distasteful neurons, which reinforce each other to be in a state of mutual maintenance. A woman is feeling pain, she's apprehensive, she's anticipating pain, she feels it revolves and revolves in the group of that neuron pathway. So what is a PTSD experience of this hyperaroused state? The woman can't relax enough to allow herself to have some pleasure. A moderate increase in sympathetic nervous activation would normally be associated with pleasant increases of sexual arousal. Pressure increases and breathing becomes rapid as sexual excitement grows. But too much of this is pushing into high gear, into too much active nervous system gets way, way too activated. And so PTSD and sexual activity both involve physiological arousal, but healthy sexual function also requires the inhibition of a fear of threat marks. The amygdala is active in arousal. The PET scans have determined that even though it's uh, active during arousal, there's decreased activity in the amygdala during orgasm. In patients with PTSD, the amygdala and other fear regions are not adequately suppressed. So what happens is the coupling of physiological arousal with fear and anxiety can override positive sexual experience. So that in these instances, arousal signals impending threat rather than pleasure. And once again, once these associations have been forged in the intense experience of trauma, it can be difficult to uncouple them. Now this, uh, this slide of the brain shows the anterior cingulate cortex which is the part of the brain that connects the emotional limbic system with the cognitive prefrontal cortex. It, the role of the anterior cingular cortex is to dampen the amygdala's response to pain and to the reaction to fear. But for those with PTSD, its function is reduced and it cannot sufficiently inhibit the overactive amygdala. Emotional pain and physical pain during intercourse diminishes the enjoyment, obviously, of both the, man, the woman and her partner. Many women respond to these conditions with feelings of anger or inadequacy. Some male partners, as I was saying before, have expressed feelings of guilt for experiencing sexual desire towards their partners, knowing that their advances cannot be sufficiently reciprocated without pain. Some women have expressed feelings of shame over being damaged different or less than. These negative messages regarding their permanently destroyed sexuality can trigger negative expectations on the possibility of experiencing sexual pleasure, provoking a form of mental infibulation. Unfortunately, FGM has typically been shrouded in secrecy, and the belief that sexual matters are to be kept private also makes many survivors inclined to keep quiet about their symptoms and suffer in silence or attribute their pain to other sources. I hope this came up well on you. Yeah. So I'm going to read what it says here. And I never say healed, I always say towards healing because it, it's so much more truthful than feeling like you're healed. So the first reminder, this is an outline I keep for myself and I share with others. The model and the message always has to be, you may be different, but you're never less than. 
each one of us is different. And you may have some missing parts, but that doesn't mean you're less than a man. And to remind women who've been cut that there are plenty of women who are not cut who have sexual problems. And just because you have a clitoris doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory. It is important to refer to gynecological and neurogynecological care in case a woman does have a physical or medical problem that is preventing her from being and experiencing more pleasure. It's important to review genital anatomy like I did earlier today and the stress response. It helps clients become aware of their own nervous system reactions. And in order to become aware of triggers and dissociation, you have to understand how your own nervous system works and in response to what. Mindfulness helps reduce reactivity to inner experiences and increases the capacity to respond with patience, awareness, intention, and kindness. It helps us feel more grounded. And when we're feeling more grounded, we have a greater ability to self-regulate. It's important to expand the notion of sexuality and sensuality. And what does that mean? Not for it to be in two boxes of them. Um, and to discuss what that might feel like for the patient, the client. It's important to relearn touch and establish boundaries and autonomy. So many women grow up thinking their chief reason to be with men is to please them. And what does it mean to turn the table around and say, no, what does it mean to please you? And how would you like to be pleased? And if you, you may not know what that is right now. You have to explore it and be patient. You may have been this way for 30 years. It's not going to happen overnight where you're going to be able to allow yourself the exploration necessary to discover what makes you feel good. Often you just have to take sex off the table and focus on pleasure, not performance. And you have to stop whenever necessary. Healing is about never having to do anything with your body you don't want to. And it's about being in control of the flow and intensity of traumatic memory rather than being controlled by them. So although you may remember a traumatic experience, you don't have to relive it. And that's the difference to develop a, a dual perspective about being in the moment right here, right now. You may be having a flashback, but the more that you can remain present, the more that flashback will be a memory, not a reliving of the experience. And I handed out some reference sheets. But that Rothschild, for anybody that's interested, is a fabulous resource to help you, if you wish, understand how to work with trauma and to develop really good tools that you can give to your clients. Sure. I just wanted, okay, I'm going to talk, I talked about the medicalization before. Um, two decades of trends, but the abandonment rates are uneven. Some countries have increased FGM, others have not, but you also have to take into fact that the population rates are booming in these countries. And so the abandonment rates, I can't keep up with the population rates. And we have to have a conversation, you know, you think that talking about FGM is one thing and that you want to abandon FGM, but in our country and in the Western world, female genital cosmetic surgeries are on the rise. So African proponents who believe in FGM say, okay, in the third world you call this mutilation, but in the Western world it's okay, it's sanctioned, it's cosmetic surgery. So it's really tricky sometimes. You have to be aware of that it's like a double message and it's not right, it's not fair. So these are called vaginal rejuvenation surgeries and they are rising in dramatic numbers in pursuit of the pornographic vagina where desirable vulvas are portrayed as neat and youthful, all the while implying that overall diversity is pathological. So these are some of the surgeries that exist. Labiaplasty, clitoral repositioning, vaginoplasty, vaginal tightening. Okay. 
and many of these surgeries have, have accompanying consequences like what you know, such as decreased fitting and general sensation to infections, tissue adhesions, and swelling. Oh, that graph didn't come to me. Okay, <clears throat> this is just a graph showing the increased rates in the UK and Australia between uh, labiaplasty and vulvoplasty, how the rates are rising. According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, more than 10 million plastic surgery procedures focusing on female genitals were performed in 2014. Yeah. Jamie Mackin and McCartney um, is a British artist, and he got very tired of so many women getting female genital cosmetic surgeries because they didn't like the their genitals left. All vulvas are unique, but usually there's just one kind of vulva shape being displayed in the popular media, whether it's magazine, mainstream porn, or even biology books. And this has led many of us to believe that we don't fit the normal image. Inspired by the rise of cosmetic procedures that dictate how a woman should look, British artist Jamie cast over 400 women genitalia in plaster of Paris to celebrate vulva diversity, and he didn't pay any of them, but all volunteered, and has exhibited his art all over the European capitals. He writes, the vagina became this only place to shame them. There's a whole industry that is set up to persuade women they're defective. He calls it body fascism. So sometimes I show this slide and say, we have to celebrate diversity, and here is a way to celebrate diversity. And not to look like a cookie cutter of a Barbie doll, prepubescent, or the pornographic vagina. I think that has been a very big deal, by the way. Okay, now I was talking before about the fact that the federal law was declared unconstitutional. Should I? Okay, well, states, important for each state to have a law. There's been an increase in that. Um, the, the, there was a, a test, excuse me, a report done by the Population Bureau in 2013 that estimated that there were a half a million women between the ages of 15 and 49 in the United States who had been cut over at risk of being cut. And the three leading countries, the three sending countries here, are Egypt, Ethiopia, and Somalia. These are states that have the highest concentration of survivors for women who are affected or can be affected. So, and I've listed the states on the right so you can see what they are. The darkest color orange indicates that there are 25,000 or more of these women and girls. And the lighter states, as you can tell, is 10,000 to 25 and then five to 10. So this is important. The more we know about this practice and can, can approach this population with cultural sensitivity, the better off. We'll be able to be with them and to understand what their experience has been and what their needs might, might be. Not everybody that comes to see me is talking about her FGM, even though they're all survivors. Um, I think this is clear to you all social work students. You know, the fact that there's under-reporting because women don't want interpreters to be describing what's going on with them within their community. There's fear and distrust for the medical world. Usually in their country, it's all do people go to the hospitals and then they die. So there's a lot of information here. It's a learning curve. It's a psychoeducation to help them. Of course, there's a language barrier, a communication barrier. Um, Fear, distress, this is very self explanatory. These are some do's and don'ts about engaging clients, which you can read on your own. Did it come through clearly on the sheet? No, okay. Okay. Oh, cool. okay. Okay, great. And then, now this was a Norwegian a study that took 21. Uh, surveys 
of women living in the Western world from FGO practicing countries. And what prompted them to continue the practice was the cultural tradition. That was the main motivating force. And there were four reasons not to continue it. And their abandonment um, reasons were because they found out that it's really not a religious requirement, that it is illegal in the Western world, and that the health consequences that they suffer are directly related to FGO, and that the host country disapproves of this practice. And all those factors involved helped them to abandon the practice once they came to the, to the Western world. It's important to break the silence that perpetuates this, this practice, and naming it is the first step in the paradigm shift. I think I'll stop here, but thank you folks. Thank you for your patience, uh, for your interest, and um, good luck with the work that you do, each and every one of you, wherever you may be. Well, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, everyone. Give me just a moment here, and um, we have a bunch of questions for you. Okay. So. Oh, there is a class coming in soon, so um, we could do about like five minutes of questions. Sure. I think sure, we'll do. If anybody wants additional answers, they can always contact you. Sure. Thank you, Joanna. Um, sure. Suzanne asks, what are your thoughts on whether removing the prep the prep use should be treated in the same manner as clitorectomies and amphibulations. Yes, I understand the question I've been asked before. I think any injury for non-medical reasons to the genitalia yeah, is not a good idea. Um, I cannot support it myself. Um, unless there's a medical necessity for some reason. I, you know, because people can cut more than they're supposed to. You can still get infections. You can still get tissue adhesions. You can still have a, a pain later on as an adult. It's still a trauma memory in your body. Is there another question? Yes, my, I'm bad. Oh, I'm bad. I was on mute. Anne asks, how are we gaining this data? Is it when they see a doctor that they inform them, or does the doctor ask the patient? That's also a very good question. I, I am working with a woman who had six children before the doctor said to her, what happened to you? So many of the, a lot of the medical profession doesn't know how to ask the question. I've done grand rounds in hospitals and I've had doctors come up to me and say, we've had these patients, but we didn't know what to say or how to say it. And they didn't say anything, so we didn't say anything. So I think the best way, if somebody notices something that's really vastly different, or you can say, I noticed that you come from a country that practices this tradition. Have you also been cut? Have you been closed? Kind of really very matter of factly to allow the woman to, to speak if she wants to. She can say, I have, but I have no problems. Or she could say, yes, I have, and start a whole conversation. Great, thank you, Joanna. And one final question here. Um, Zainabu asks, so how would you advise people in the African-American community on what, what are the key things they should educate, be educated on? The reasons that it's, the practice continues and how to have discussions around what those reasons are. I guess it all depends what the African community is presenting. Um, I work with individuals, and so it's important to me to find out what the individual issue is. I don't know that I can answer it, you know, globally like the African community, because everybody is so unique. Um, maybe she can just ask me that question with a little bit more detail. Sure, sure. And, and everyone will have my email address once, once I send out the link to your evaluation and post test here. So please feel free to contact me and I'll be glad to connect you with Joanna if that works for everyone. Joanna? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to share the fact that it's so important that these women not feel ashamed in any way. And um, the Western world has 
it looks down upon this practice and it's critically important for we none of us should do that it's it, this is a custom this is a tradition they are survivors it's a fine line to walk between trying to help women abandon the tradition and trying to help support the survivors um so there's a, a woman in, in the UK calls the survivors champions, and I have to agree with her. They are champions, amazing women. So maybe just opening the conversation up with them and saying, how can we talk about this? What is comfortable for you? And starting from there. Well, thank you, Joanna. Um, and I think that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all on behalf of the Minnesota Center for Chemical and Mental Health. Thank you all for joining us for our extended special webinar event. I'd like to extend an extra special thanks to Joanna Vergoth for sharing her time and talents with us today, to the AHA Foundation and uh, MinCam's very own Emma Wolf for helping to make this possible. Thank you all and we will be in touch. Thank you folks for your patience and interest. I appreciate it.